I'm Lauren Crawford, and I believe that life should be a drag. Um, but more seriously, I see drag as an accessible art form that has something to offer to anyone. So, just a little bit about me. I'm a senior majoring in finance and economics here at the University of Alabama. I'm originally from Baton Rouge, Louisiana, although this summer I'll be moving to New York City. And as far as my interests go, I've always had a particular interest in all things dramatic. So for 14 years, I did ballet. Beyonce, who I clearly have a deep emotional connection to. <laughs> and of course, drag queens. So as far as how I became interested in the world of drag and drag queens, I have none other to, to thank than the queens here in the mecca of drag, Tuscaloosa, Alabama. <laughs> um, thanks to my gracious, patient friend who agreed to take some me and clueless girls to our first drag show downtown at Icon, I was able to experience for the very first time this new art form. I remember feeling a little out of my comfort zone, but overall excited. And so the show started, the queen took the stage, absolutely confident, just owning this audience with her gravity-defined jumpsuit and wig. She strategically started with the Britney number, the crowd pleaser, and then transitioned into Christina Aguilera's beautiful, you know the one. <laughs> so she's performing this, and I am just completely mesmerized and taken in by this illusion, this magic. And while I'm having this one distinct experience for myself, another girl in my group is having quite another. I guess, overwhelmed by the sentiment of the song that we are all, in fact, beautiful. She just burst into tears, just totally emotional at, at this queen's performance that she actually had to excuse herself. Um, so this is the first time that I was able to see this idea that drag has something different to offer to different people. So before I launch into my argument for why I believe this to be true, I'd like to give you a quick taste of drag's history through the years. <laughs> through the years. Um, now I'm sure a lot of us are familiar with common appearances of drag in classical theater. So this includes examples like Shakespearean theater um, in Elizabethan England. During this time it was actually forbidden for women to appear on the stage because it was considered indecent and inappropriate. Um, the same went for kabuki theater in Japan around the same time and so men and young boys were having to take up the roles of women. <coughs> But perhaps some less well-known instances of drag in the theater are vaudevillian performers. Here pictured is Julian Elton, one of the most famous female impersonators of his time. In fact, he was so commercially successful that he actually had his own magazine that he marketed beauty products to, to women and other female impersonators. And his talents, just like many others, translated well to the early Broadway stage, although at this point in time, Drag was seen as pure entertainment because it was just men appearing in women's clothing, and that, people really got a kick out of that. Um, it was also used as sort of a comedic trope, um, oftentimes used by characters to escape dicey situations, so they would put on their female attire and escape. Now this trend continued and compounded in film. Here are two famous films, Some Like It Hot with Marilyn Monroe, and I Was a Male War Bride. And the same went for early television as well, continuing on in today, too. This is actually a still from one of the episodes of the popular show I Love Lucy, in which um, actually Lucy and Milton Berle both appeared in drag. It wasn't until around the 1950s that drag really went through what I'm calling it a renaissance, meaning drag finally went from this hilarious, mainstream pleasing um, tool to something of its own its own culture. For the very first time, various LGBTQ communities around the country were taking this culture, creating something new out of it. And although this is occurring um, over a pretty wide time period, I'd like to pinpoint one exact time period and place, which is 1960s to the 1990s in Harlem, New York City. Now, specific communities of both black and Latinx, trans and gay people came together and created their own art form at these fantastic, elaborate events known as drag balls. It was at these drag balls that these performers were not only able to push the bounds and explore their own gender, but also develop their drag, their personas, their fashion. 
And actually, the creativity that stemmed from these balls eventually made it to the mainstream. Maybe you're familiar with the dancing style voguing. Madonna did not invent that. Drag queens did. And so, now that we just have a brief taste of drag history and things have sort of put in, been put into context, I'd like to argue why I see drag not only as an accessible art form, but one that can offer something unique to anyone. So, just personally, I enjoy drag because at its core, I see it as a celebration of femininity. And as someone who is comfortable with their own femininity and enjoys expressing it, it's almost flattering to see these performers get up there, put themselves out there, contort their bodies in some of the most uncomfortable ways, as I'm sure you can imagine, to celebrate this idea. It's empowering, it's inspiring to see such power driven from something that I possess, which is this unflinchingly powerful thing known as femininity, and I just love it. Now, understandably, this might not resonate with all of you, so I'm going to continue to make my case for why I think you can make, get something out of this drag, out of this art form. And this is because drag is multifaceted. Now, I've included just a few of the categories. This is by no means exhaustive of drag. This first queen uh, emulates what, we know, what is known as campy drag. It's over the top, it's dramatic, it's funny. Uh, this is actually one of the most famous drag queens of her time, Divine. Um, her personality was so over the top and larger than life that she was actually the one to inspire the Disney character Ursula from Little Mermaid. We also have comedy queens. This is actually my favorite queen of all time, Bianca Del Rio, and famous queen Coco Peru. Basically, they just do stand-up in drag, but it's great and it's funny. Um, we also have queens that specifically specialize in lip syncing, whether that be songs or uh, cleverly put together monologues from movies, plays, that sort of thing. We also have look queens who use platforms like Instagram and YouTube to put together these larger-than-life looks. Um, up top we have Kim Chi and Mary Cherry. As you can see, they're creating art on their face. We also have queens that invoke the style of the 90s club kids. Um, this is M Queen, a trans performer, who, as you can see, just goes for it. <laughs> it's weird, it's, it's interesting, it's thought-provoking. We also have pageant queens. These are queens that participate in pageants, uh, like, just like mainstream pageants. This is actually one of the recent winners of the Miss Gay USA pageant, which is one of the most prominent ones in their circuit. We also have queens that are known as fishy queens, and basically their shtick, I guess you could say, is to, to appear as close to a cisgendered woman as possible. And as you can see, they're clearly capable of really creating some magic here. We also have queens who use their drag for politics. This is actually a local queen here in Alabama who dressed in drag and went to a Roy Moore um, campaign uh, protest, sorry protest. Uh, and then we have things like this, which is probably the scariest thing I've ever seen. This is the queen hungry, and she does what she calls distorted drag. So as you can see, drag has evolved. It's new, it's cutting edge, and it, there's a wide range of it, whether that be just for pure entertainment value to fashion and art. You'd be hard pressed, basically, to not find some part of it that you would enjoy. There's also something on the point of accessibility that I think makes drag unique and that is that it's so interactive. There's actually a custom at many live drag shows in which a queen will descend from her stage while she's performing and mingle with her audience, during which time the audience will offer up a courtesy dollar or two as a way to thank this queen for going out of her way to look this great, having spent all this money, and it creates these amazing little connections between the audience member and the queen something that you might not necessarily be able to get at any other sort of live performance. It can really only be described as special. And here's examples of that. <laughs> and finally, what makes drag more accessible than ever today is that it is popular culture. I'm sure many of you are familiar with the TV show RuPaul's Drag Race, but what you might not know is that it's now featured on a major network, VH1, and it's won two Emmys. So it's clear that it's captured the imaginations of mainstream audiences. Um, on your right here, we actually have two RuPaul's Drag Race alums who have their own show on Viceland, the Trixie and Katia show. 
Even major Broadway productions, like Kinky Boots, feature several drag performers as well as one as its main character. Even drag makeup trends are influencing the mainstream. Because no, Kim Kardashian did not invent contouring, drag queens did. It's clear that drag is here to stay, it's in the mainstream, and it's continuing to evolve. evolve. Um, nowadays, men, though not necessarily identifying as drag queens themselves, are able to create lucrative careers for themselves by doing makeup tutorials on <coughs> Instagram and YouTube. We even talk like drag queens nowadays, using common vernacular from drag queens, specifically from the black queer community, words like slay, work, realness, yes, or my favorite, not today, Satan. Drag queens are gracing runways, they're inspiring fashion, they're even inspiring new television shows like Lip Sync Battle, which of course RuPaul refers to as a watered down version of what real queens do. So here it is, your invitation to go explore this rich, fascinating, accessible art form. For me, drag has created so many new experiences, so many wonderful memories, and what I love more than anything is for you to go out and explore and find some way to connect with drag yourself. Thank you.